Hello, good afternoon everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I hope everyone is well and healthy. Um, so we have a, a special guest today uh, with us, uh, Bang Sandiaga Uno. And um, for the introduction, I'd like to uh, welcome our CEO, SGVP CEO, CEO uh, Pak Oni Jamhari. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Bang Sandi for joining, joining us uh, for this webinar. Um, as you know, we, we are dealing with um, something that's quite uncommon, uh, unprecedented, and um, a lot of, um, we're, we're, we're dealing with a lot of problems right now. And one of the problems that we are facing is, of course, um, in the economic aspect. And uh, of course, uh, there are consequences to the small and micro enterprises in Indonesia as well. So, um, so I'd like to invite Paoni Jamhari to give welcoming remarks before we start. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes, you, Pony. Yes, Pony. Yes, thank, yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome, Pak Fed, uh, Pak Sandiaga Uno to SVPP. So we have uh, our special guest today, Pak Sandiaga Uno, who is going to talk about the uh, SME Indonesia. So thanks again, Pak Sandiaga, and welcome to SVPP. Thank you very much for Paoni and pa Safendri for hosting this and for having me. Uh, the, uh, the topic of today is the impact for SMEs. And it's a great honor for me to be invited in a very prestigious school. I was talking to pa Gita a few nights ago to discuss about the economic policy response by the government and what we could do more. And I'd like to also use this uh, occasions to say Alhamdulillah that we are still very healthy and we still can gather uh, in this uh, lecture. I also like us to call for a prayer to all our brothers and sisters Indonesians who have been impacted by COVID-19. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heal them. And also may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen uh, their family so they could fully recover. I also like to ask for the participants to join us in a special prayer to the medical team, the doctors, the nurses, and all the medical staffers who are fighting this on the front line on a daily basis. And while we're here studying from home, uh, they are risking their lives, trying to stop the pandemic and to keep us healthy. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also grant them the safety and keep them healthy. So with, uh, with that, I'd like to open my remark uh, on this topic. Uh, I term this economy, economy during COVID. So we put this in one easy word to remember economy. And I'd like to basically talk through a couple of slides and right away jump to the question and answers. So I can field some of the questions that the students or the panelists may have and make it a, a more interactive. You can use the chat column on the bottom and try to tabulate all the questions there and I ask for the help from the host to tabulate the questions so that we could field and answer the questions within uh, this, this coming hour. So the next slide that I wanna 
share is this is unlike any crisis that we have ever seen. This is completely unprecedented. This is probably going to register as the uh, most difficult crisis that the uh, modern Indonesia have to deal with. And unlike the crisis in 1997, 98, as well as the crisis in 2008, 2009, this started with a health crisis, the coronavirus. And we have to really understand that this is unlike a common flu. This is an unlike any, this is unlike any normal type of sickness that we have experienced before. This is very, very highly infectious. And so far, more than 2.5 million people around the world have contracted the virus that started in China. And currently, we are here in Indonesia with around 7,000 plus case. I just finished a session this morning with the Special Task Force against COVID-19, whereby we are now gathering that not only, oh, I, I tried to uh, start my video, but uh, the host has stopped it. So um, I guess the host doesn't want to see my face. Uh, which is no, okay. not really, Wang. Not really. <laughs> Sorry. Which I'm is the host. Okay. Uh, I, I can talk without. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing my face every day in the mirror. So. Yeah, but maybe the viewers want to see your face, Bang. If yeah, it's okay. I, I am starting my video, but it's reading. You cannot start your video because oh, the, really? the host has stopped it. Okay, just a minute, Bang. I'll try alert. To... Maybe my face will oh, Okay, okay. I got it, Bang, already. Sorry, the setting was, was uh, unchecked. Now ah, it should okay. be okay, yeah. How do I look? Are you look, uh, yeah, I think everyone can see you now. Can everyone see Bang Sandy? I look okay. If you Perfect can one. see me, can you? <laughs> yes, you look glorious. Can you, put, can you put in the chat column, fight against COVID, Lawan. Put it, I wanna see a hundred numbers there. Still 19, 20. Okay, please Lawan write COVID. down. Put it there. Yeah, put some mana suaranya, put some noise into there. Yeah, yeah. I have not seen Marcella put, come on, Marcella. Yeah, okay, Faida, Muhammad Maliki, Rita, Putra, Pak Safendri, Yuza, Bernadetta, Wawan, Alif Bani, Anugra Pandey. Yeah, 70, we have 30 to go, Andrianto. Ardanta, you have not put in. Ardanta Shareza, Yulita Teguh, Pelagus. Yeah. Lawan COVID, put some really force because optimism will get us there. Together we could conquer this COVID. 10 more. We have Lawan COVID. Yes. Siska, thank you. Andrew Johannes, thank you so much. We are in this together indeed. Yeah, Dodi, thank you so much. Fauzan Fikri, Lisa, 99, yeah, and finally, we pass it, yeah, we can do it, yes, yes, I agree with all of you, we could fight COVID together, and if we are together, united, we will be able to defeat COVID-19. This country has gone so many crises, and because of our Gotong Royong fabric, of our social fabric, and because of Pancasila, and Bineka Tungalika, I think we will be able to survive this crisis and put this thing back uh, to recovery. Going back, I'd like to talk about this first slide. So if you look at this, which has started like a, a typical sort of like flu-like symptoms, but it was really devastating in terms of starting from Wuhan it went through all over the world. Now more than 200 countries are affected by it. And if you look at the number, the scarier part is it, it goes so quickly. 
And if you look at the red curve, which is like showing how without public health measures, this numbers, and this is actually a statistical modeling from epidemiologists, from uh, experts in the public health sectors would predict that the number of cases of people who got really sick will surpass the system capacity of our healthcare, of our hospitals. And this is what we're seeing in Italy. We're seeing somewhat in New York, whereby people are fighting this uh, pandemic by very, very, uh, in, a, in a very difficult situation. So this comes from the model. However, with some kind of public health measures and the government has selected the uh, PSBB, which is the large scale social limitations, you would be able to flatten the curve as well as you'll be able to, the new word is blunt. Uh, these are some of the numbers that uh, Jakarta is in the red zone, especially south part of Jakarta where I live. And the only thing we could do at the moment is stay at home, do social distancing, help, help in any where you can. If you have some additional savings, try to help people who are in need. And the stronger containment measures, the government has just announced the no mudik for this year or annual going home to the village. Uh, we need to support it. And we, we need to put incentives to people who work for us not to go back because this will worsen the situations. We also need to cut uh, the in terms of the long tail effect of the crisis. So if you look at the crisis, it is going to be determined by the number of cases on the X uh, axis and on the Y axis is the time. So how you shorten this by putting in the right uh, program, which is testing and tracing. This is what we started earlier this morning, as well as hopefully one day we could find a vaccine to be able to create a massive immunity among the people. Uh, second slide, very quickly. This is in terms of economy. Now, you will be able to see that there are two crises happening at the same time, actually three crises. Uh, the other crisis is coming up, which is a social crisis. But first is the health crisis. It has transformed into an economic crisis Soon, if we're not ready, if we're not careful, it will turn into a social crisis. This is the shape of the economic crisis. Now, you would see the recession is defined as people uh, in SGPP have learned that recession is defined as, right in the chat column, two quarters of negative growth of contracting economy. So we are seeing now the sharpest economic contractions in modern times. Uh, people have now see this as one of uh, uh, unprecedented, whereby we are putting the economic bailout package. America just announced 2 trillion, which is close to 10% uh, of their GDP. Japan issued a package and uh, many, many other countries uh, as well. Indonesia have come up with uh, 400 trillion worth of package, mainly for social safety net, as well as for SMEs. And there will be more and more package uh, coming up later. But the gist of, a, of this policy is how you bring cash immediately to the people because there are four sectors of our economy. First is a household economy. We need to continue to, be, to make the household be able to, to put food on the table. And with that, they need direct cash transfer. They need also to have the cash turned into some basic food staples. We call it sambaco. And then uh, secondly is the SME sectors, which we're gonna talk uh, here. And 
if you could solve SMEs, and SMEs, as you know, is 60% plus of our economy, 97% plus of the job creations, and 99.9% .9 of the uh, total number of units. So if we are focusing on the majority of the economy, we will have a much higher chance of survival and much sooner recovery, especially some of the informal workers. Some sectors are very hit harder, hardest, like the, uh, some sectors like tourism, travel. So we need to, to help them out. Next slide. Uh, we are hoping that this will be a fee curve a V curve, which is a V shape. Um, let's not hope that it will be a J, uh, like an L shape, but uh, more like a V curve, whereby we are expecting that hopefully the lowest point will not that deep and the angle of the V curve is not that wide, but rather uh, short term in, in time lapse from the first time that this enters into an economic crisis. So as long as government make the right policy, and I don't wanna argue on what the government is, is doing because uh, we're focusing on the SMEs, we're gonna have another lecture if you wanna really digest what the government, whether the government is doing the right package or not. But so far Asian authorities have responded. So if you look at Taiwan, not that much, uh, Next would be India uh, in terms of percentage of their GDP, uh, the fiscal stimulus. And then Indonesia is um, also there. They, uh, it's uh, still below 5%. But if you look at Thailand, Hong Kong, Thailand is because of the tourism, Hong Kong, Singapore, even Malaysia, the package is 15% of their GDP and Japan is the highest, close to 20% of the GDP. Now we can talk about the size, the method, as well as the transmissions uh, method that will be used by the government to bring forward this economic package. Uh, and, and we could see the size uh, among the countries. So if you, if you look at it, some analysts said that Indonesia is the least impacted in terms of the number of cases, because we're still at number, is around 7,000 numbers that we have. Uh, but the, uh, we are at the risk of um, having to deal with difficulties because of our debt profile is very high already. If we go out and borrow money to fund this fiscal stimulus, as well as the dependence of the country on foreign exchange, because we import a lot of our uh, needs, uh, including food. So we have to be uh, really careful in navigating uh, in terms of the policy. Um, when you talk about SMEs, you talk about job creations. Next slide, we'll talk about the uh, terminations of employment. People call it uh, furlough. Some say it, uh, it's PHK. Uh, I was a victim of PHK in 97, 98 crisis, whereby I lost my job. I was a professional and I lost my job. I remember how uh, the pain, the, it is so difficult to lose a job because you don't have your, your monthly income. And we are now seeing a, a very mind boggling number, very staggering number, more than 2 million people will soon be out of a job and more coming, close to 5 million. In fact, in Indonesia and in the US, it is already 15%. So the company performance will definitely drastically reduce. And unlike 97, 98, this 2020 crisis, the SMEs is being hit the hardest in the first weeks of the crisis. Why? Because there is no mobility because the mobility is being restricted, SMEs lost the aggregate demand and the revenues that they normally have from the food and beverage stalls, coffee uh, traders, as well as um, 
the informal sectors, people who sell uh, warung tegal, nasi padang, all closed down. And these are against the backbone of the economy, 60% plus of our economies, the SMEs. Um, financial dis- difficulties, uh, some employers are reducing wage. Some have uh, even layoff workers because they don't have liquidity. Uh, these are the numbers. Uh, ILO said 1.25 billion workers is at the risk of being laid off. In Indonesia, 74,000 companies already laying off. Uh, in Jakarta in particular, uh, you see that uh, 18,000 companies, uh, more than 150,000 workers have been uh, laid off. So the impact, and these are, if you go back to the original formula, these are primarily SMEs because they are hit the, the hardest and within the first two weeks of the, uh, the crisis. So these numbers mainly come from the SMEs. The bigger companies could sustain a little longer, uh, but the SMEs are really now very much in, in a very uh, challenging situations and they have no liquidity. Uh, next slide. These are when your body needs immunity, it needs vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin B. When an entrepreneur, SME entrepreneurs having some problems with their ongoing business, some going concerns issue, they would need vitamin as well. So the vitamin for entrepreneur, I call it vitapreneur. And the principle, there are five principles. First, the impact on the SMEs is the flight to cash because all SMEs will preserve their cash. Cash is king. Right now, the liquidity, which is represented by cash, is is very difficult to get. So what they're doing now is first, we call it mantap which is short for makan tabungan. They are basically withdrawing from their savings. But here, the SMEs are starting to renegotiate some of their liabilities. They're starting to reschedule some overdue payments. They are having bills that they had to pay. They're now taking more time to settle their bills to pay. And therefore, if you can if you want to help SMEs, try to uh, pre- uh, help them preserve their cash. So expenses such as electricity bills, quota for their phones, uh, school fees, any kind of fees that SMEs, uh, which is the mom and pop stores need, is something that uh, would go back to the first rule or first principle, which is cash. Okay. The second impact to SME definitely is how soon they can adapt to new normal. This type of lecture is a new normal. We, during COVID-19 and post COVID-19, it is actually adapting to how soon we could embrace the uh, industrial revolutions 4.0. So the new normal, many, many things. Uh, For instance, we have, uh, I will show you uh, SMEs now producing this. This is from Batik. Very nice. This is Batik. It's uh, now SMEs that normally sells uh, hijab, now sells uh, this mask, face mask. And some also, this is very nice, black. In the old days, when you put this, people scared. They thought that you were going to rob the stores, but this is now the new normal. New normal, people wear like this. And I even have my own brand. My own brand, can you see? This is a Sandy Uno brand. Some SMEs produce this, very nice. 6,000 rupiah, you can get one. And please wash it every day. And this could go for Times additional cloth here and here you can put the cloth and you can see you can.
can take it away. And you normal is one areas whereby SMEs needs to do quickly. Another new normal is internet. Now a lot of uh, work from home, study from home requires internet service. A new normal is some opportunities coming up in the uh, technology sectors. Webcam is sold out, uh, speakers, external monitors is all sold out. Uh, and this is uh, basically the new normal. If you don't have access to those products, some SMEs already turn to become resellers. Third is survive through ecosystems. A lot of SMEs, pretty much like the travel tourism industries, they are hit the hardest, but they have database of customers. So now they're collaborating with some of their friends who offer the vitamins or ginger or food and they offer to their database of uh, customers. So people are now starting to collaborate. And this is what I call ecosystem. Fourth, now that you spend most of your time at home, a lot of SMEs now are upgrading their skills. They're taking training online. They're reading some of the uh, new techniques and new opportunities. So they invest in themselves, invest in upgrading uh, their skills. And fifth is uh, like all SMEs, uh, they're very hardworking uh, group of sectors. They need to stay calm in the storm. During the storm, you don't risk going out. You stay inside, wait till the storm pass, don't, don't waste your uh, energy fighting the storm. You're not, you're not gonna be able to beat the storm, but stay inside, stay home, stay healthy, and then don't, don't get panicked uh, because uh, a lot of uh, people have, uh, have advice. And this is a time that you seek advice from your religious teachers. And I just got an advice yesterday from some ulama saying that uh, Allah will not test you beyond your capability to endure the pain. So yeah, let's uh, hope that we could, uh, we could actually learn something from this crisis and, and actually not uh, panic and, and improve. And hopefully uh, we will be stronger together coming from this crisis. Uh, Next slide, I'm gonna go very quickly. Um, this is the right time for entrepreneurs to pivot. Some potential winners, these slides have actually made, uh, went viral. Uh, this is, uh, people are now, the new normal is thinking about how they ensure that they would uh, invest in medical supply and services. Post COVID-19, people will take care of their health better. Uh, they will consume the right kind of food, the nutritious food, no goreng gorengan, you know, no oily stuff. More uh, food, which is healthy food, will be in demand. Personal health care, people will wash their hand more. They would need soaps, hand sanitizers. They would need uh, personal gloves. ICT, e-commerce, agricultural, food will be... Uh, uh, the focus and now also the potential winners are the uh, new and renewable energy because people are now starting to realize that, hey, the environment is much nicer. I can see ja uh, blue sky in Jakarta. I have not seen blue sky for the longest time in Jakarta. Now I could see it. So adopt the new normal, pivot and create uh, your way of uh, sectors uh, that is more productive uh, going forward and keep the supply chains going. Make sure that you focus on creating productive productions capability in Indonesia, not everything you import, but you create productions capability, food in particular, energy, uh, water and other supplies. Because if you control the supply chains, the next time 
a global exogenous shock like this come, uh, happening, that you are more prepared. I think I have two more final slides uh, very quickly. Uh, this is a case during uh, outbreak that some very successful startups uh, in fintech uh, are now chasing down new pandemic funding. So these are fintech company uh, Stripe uh, just raised six hundred million dollars. These are SMEs uh, in the financial technology space. Uh, what is their valuations? Thirty six billion dollar. Now during this coronavirus, people say, oh, you know, very difficult to find money. This is another SME showing that if you are in the right sectors, people are now converting to fintech. Uh, people don't want to hold cash anymore because it may have the coronavirus. So uh, Stripe uh, showed it. Uh, Australian Air Wallex raised $160 million in Series D funding, $1.8 billion valuations during this very difficult time. Visa, the credit card uh, giant in the world, bought Plate for 5.3 billion, and the list goes on. So if you're a, if you are SMEs in the right sectors, it's actually showing that uh, there is still hope, there is uh, opportunity. And if you choose to stay positive uh, and, and be optimistic, uh, you will be able to not only survive the crisis, but be more successful. Final two slides. Uh, the next slide that I want to share is, this is, uh, I'm sure there are some Chinese uh, reading, some Chinese speaking students. Uh, but I was told that the Mandarin character for a crisis is Wei Qi. Wei means danger and Qi means opportunity. So whenever there is a danger, uh, there's opportunity. The crisis in 97, 98, I lost my job. But the opportunity is I created a small consulting company uh, focusing on financial restructuring. Now the, the company that I started in 97, 98 with three people, now is uh, Alhamdulillah is one of the largest investment company in South Asia with uh, 30,000 uh, employees across uh, sectors. And I think uh, if SMEs are be able to adapt to this new normal, uh, we could see more SMEs actually stronger following this crisis. And final slide, I want to remind all of you to continue exercise because staying at home doesn't mean you stop exercising. I still exercise at least 30 minutes a day. And by exercising, you are increasing your health immunity and hopefully you stay healthy and strong and staying at home. Hopefully together we will defeat this COVID-19 crisis. Thank you very much. I will we turn back to the host, Bapa Safendri. Thank you so much, Bang, uh, for the very uh, uplifting lecture. And well, the last one is particularly a bit difficult uh, for many of us, uh, you know, uh, trying to stay healthy by exercising every day, um, but because we eat more than we were supposed to. But Anyway, um, I'd like to invite um, the students and all the participants, if uh, any, any of you want to ask, Pasandi, uh, go ahead. I see that um, I'm going to give um, priority to our students first, yeah, Bang. Um, but Marcela, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Marcela. on your video as well, if possible. Yeah, sorry, because I don't know why, from the very beginning, my laptop it's always problem with this video. I mean, like I can see uh, all of our friends, but uh, yeah, you all cannot see me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, Masandi, thank you so much for your time. Um, and then also thank you for your optimistic side. Uh, first of all, I would like to share a little bit of my point of view. As we know, Indonesia is a very large country that produces the best food commodity in the world. The economic crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic will have an impact on the food sector. Therefore, strengthening the food 
based economy by building independent farmers, uh, fishermen, uh, informal sectors is, is the key word, uh, which is to grow uh, SMEs based on agricultural and fishery food commodity. I think there must be togetherness from all stakeholders, starting from the government that has the budget and regulation, the private sectors that runs the business, the campus through scientific research and community groups who are the main users. And my question is whether the existing policy are sufficient or do there still need to be have other regulation? And what is the political will? Is it already uh, sitting with a weak uh, economy? And the second thing uh, is if government has a roadmap for the development of UMKM as the foundation of the national economy, certainly under no circumstances will UMKM be swayed by the existence of this pandemic? And the question is how, how's the government strategy to strengthen the UMKM in this pandemic time? Because I think this current condition of this pandemic is the type of business that relies on imports at a present, many countries have locked down their territories in order to break uh, the chain of distribution of COVID-19. The only one expected is domestic industrial strength. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ibu Marcella, for the very good questions. See, um, your camera is not working well, and this is a time for you to invest in um, work from home equipments, like, uh, like a computer. And that's why it's a potential winner. Now, um, pa Andri Anto also asked about the same. The education is a potential loser. If you don't pivot, you need to pivot to the uh, industrial 4.0 era whereby you invest. This is the time that you invest in work from home. So you may get a, a new camera or a webcam that we could see you now. Anyway, I, I, I wanna go back to your questions. I have uh, to that, for that, but this one, sorry, cannot. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can show you some, uh, but you're right. All the webcam now is sold out. You cannot find a webcam. It's it's uh, it's very very uh, tough to get, and uh, the uh, new computer that will allow you to adapt uh, into work from home or homeschooling or home learning is is, is very difficult. Anyway, I got distracted um, to Pa uh, Arifanto earlier. Education needs to pivot to ICT. And when you do educations by way of uh, uh, technology, they call it edutech, then they'll become a winner. Now, how would the government help SMEs? The government in the past uh, have been helping on three sectors of the SMEs. First is market, providing access to market. Secondly, access to modal or access to their capital. And third is access to improve human capital or SDM. So during these difficult times, we have to do something out of the box because SMEs during this difficult time know that there is no market. Aggregate demand collapse. They would only look at one to three months maximum to survive. So what they need to get from the government is cash. That's why Trump administrations, I'm not a, a fan of Trump, but they did the right thing, which is send checks to all Americans, $1,200, if you, you earn less than $70,000, which is like 98% of the, the people there. And secondly, provide close to $400 billion, $400 billion worth of SME funding, because that will allow SMEs to not lay off people. That will allow SMEs to weather the crisis. And that would allow SMEs to continue to operate. So when the government reopened the economy, 
the SMEs could be there and quickly ready to, uh, to provide output to the economy. Because if they close, there are more money needed to reopen and restart their business. So with this, I going back to your earlier question, is the 400 trillion rupiah enough for the, uh, by the government to provide help to the SMEs? Let's see. I want to give the government the benefit of the doubt. I was part of the losing uh, candidates in the last elections. Uh, I, I'm not part of the government. My, my ex-partner is now uh, a minister, but I am giving a constructive input to the government where I say that I'll give the benefit of the doubt. Now 400 trillion uh, is good, but we need to make sure that this money will reach the SMEs during Ramadan. Because if they don't get the money, then you will not have the effectiveness of, of the program of order package. Secondly, check again in June, see the impact. If it's not enough, then you need to add more. Because if we are not able to contain the crisis, the health crisis by June or July, that means we will have another three to six months of recovery. So, and SMEs cannot, cannot wait three to six months. So liquidity is number one. And I think this is something that people at SGPP needs because you guys are a school of government and public policy. You guys analyze public policy. Uh, you have to put the inputs. Uh, you have to guys. You, you guys have to really look at what sectors are really in priority now. Me and Pak Gita now uh, discussing more on the other two pillars of the economy because the the two the first two pillars are households and SMEs. These are going to be our priorities. But the next two pillars are also equally very important, which is the corporate sectors as well as the financial sectors. Now you need to have separate package for these corporate sectors and financial sectors, and you need to be guided by data. And this is what we're gonna be focusing in the months to come. Thank you for the question, Ibu Marcela. Thank you, Bam. Uh, I hope that answered your question, um, Bam Marcela. Um, we have some questions from the Q&A um, section as well, Bam. So I'd like to um, read one from Aryan TGH. He said, hello from Bali. Hello, Bang Sandi. Uh, happy Earth Day to everyone. The government is working on reviewing businesses that are eligible to receive government aid as it receives reports from 37,000 SMEs severely hit by the COVID uh, pandemic. How can SMEs uh, strengthen their resilience during the COVID-19 pandemic and exercise responsible leadership after the crisis? And what can digitalization offer with respect to this? Uh, thank you. Uh, and hello, uh, our friends in Bali. Uh, my thoughts and prayers with all the people in Bali because Bali is suffering from the uh, this restricting in mobility. No, nobody is allowed to travel nowadays and you guys are relying heavily on tourism. So, and 10% of the workforce of uh, the whole country, in particular in Bali, rely on tourism. So we hope, uh, again, we pray that this, this pandemic will be over soon. Uh, your questions is how digitalization uh, can, uh, is, is it definitely right, right here? This is the, uh, this is exactly the example of how digitalization can offer some kind of uh, new normal, some kind of opportunities. Uh, but Marcela, supposed to be having the camera in front, uh, in the, in, uh, in front of her computer so we could all see her, but uh, she has not been able. So digitalizations will allow some additional output and opportunities to help people in the work from home status. Um, digitalizations, uh, we are now forced to adopt and transform digi digitalizations 
earlier than we we thought we would be. Some people said, oh, okay, 2021, 2022, we will be uh, starting to get a new computer or uh, put my business. Now we're doing online sales, but we don't, we're not doing marketing or accounting online. We're not doing uh, fulfillment online. We're not doing um, sourcing online and stuff like that. So this is going to be a fast forward to the future on digitalizations. Um, resilience. SME has been known to be very resilient, but SMEs, uh, it's, it's tough because they, they don't have the right tools at the moment. So I offer number three, the fitpreneur number three is survive through ecosystems. Uh, people have to help each other. Uh, and SMEs, I mentioned uh, a good friend of mine, Pais Naini, he's, uh, his business is uh, Hajj and Umrah travel. Completely zil. Not only he doesn't have revenue, people are now asking for refunds. Now, what, do, what does he, uh, he do nowadays? He's pivoting. He said, I have this list of customers. I have this uh, people who are ready to go to, uh, um, to go to Umrah, to go to Hajj. Uh, I will use this database to help sell kurma, jintan, and madu. It's basically dates, habatu sauda, and honey during this uh, month of Ramadan because uh, they're not traveling, but they, they need to boost their immunity. So uh, he pivot from selling tours uh, packages to selling all this basic uh, food that is uh, accustomed for people uh, going into Ramadan. So this is what I call resilient. If you are going through an ecosystems, we have a saying called silaturahim. And during, when we do silaturahim, there are two miracles that we hope God will grant us, which is panjang umur, which is long life, and murah rejeki, which is uh, additional opportunities, additional uh, business, additional uh, wealth being given to you. So this is, I would say, how we could strengthen our resilience. And leadership, is key. Uh, all of us are leaders within uh, even a smaller context. So leadership uh, have to show examples, even SMEs. I tell my SME friends, some have to uh, lay off people, some have to put uh, their workers on furlough. I said that be open and transparent. Leaders have to be open and transparent. Say, this is the cash flow that the company has. Now we need to survive. And in order for that, we need to put you on furlough. My advice to them is prioritize on the people at the bottom of the pyramid. Give them the full benefit, if possible bonus, and try to negotiate or renegotiate from the middle and upper managers for them to cut their compensations for the time being. Because the people who are in needs are people who are in the bottom of the pyramids. And this is what the SMEs are facing. So I hope uh, I, uh, I'm, I've been addressing, I've been able to address your question, Arian and Matur Suksma. Thank you, Bam. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Um, Okay, so he replied in the um, chat bang. So the next uh, questioner is from our uh, student, one of our students, uh, Jeffy. Uh, go ahead, Jeffy. You can unmute yourself, Jeff. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, dear Pak Sandi and all, uh, I wish you good evening. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, my name is Jeff. Right now, I am uh, have been studying in SGPP, uh, basics, and previously I graduated from University of Indonesia, majoring uh, metallurgical and materials engineering. Uh, Pak Sandi, actually, I I do agree with you uh, about the liquidity is number one right now. So it means that the government of Indonesia, through monetary policy, should uh, selling bonds in order to get 
uh, more liquidity. Uh, that is the first question. And uh, do you think that uh, for the fiscal policy, uh, in order to increase the GDP by lowering our import, because as you mentioned it before, we have to reduce our import right. So uh, uh, by lowering our import, um, my question is, what about increasing taxes to increase the GDP itself? Uh, but as you can see right now, uh, it is really impossible for us to increase the tax because uh, every uh, owner of the company, they are struggling, really struggling right now. And uh, the last question is, since SME uh, has contributed a lot to this country and been a backbone of Indonesia uh, uh, financial, do you think that fintech like, uh, you know, uh, fintech right now, uh, it's really uh, common, right? So do you think that fintech will generate more tax, tax revenue to Indonesia GDP? Okay, that's all uh, from me, uh, Pak Sandi. Thank, Thank you, you Pak. So Thank you, Pak Jeffrey. Uh, the last question, I believe that we need to reform our uh, tax systems, and I think Ibu Sri Maljani has uh, started to do some kind of reform. And the uh, future will be uh, tech and digital companies. People like uh, Netflix during this uh, pandemic, they had the best month ever in the history of the company, in the short history of the company. 60 million new customers signed up to Netflix. And most also coming from Indonesia uh, because we we like the contents there. Uh, so fintech company also, there are uh, reports saying that uh, people who now converted their regular banking, traditional banking to fintech is, uh, uh, is increasing on uh, many, many fold. So uh, if the reform is focusing on how we could work with fintech company, uh, in order to widen our tax base, widen our tax base, because now the, the problem is our tax base is limited. It has not been able to, be, to, to grow. It has not been able to, be, uh, to expand. So use the collaborations. Don't, don't say to FinTech company, we're gonna tax you. It, it, you know, I was an entrepreneur before, I was a businessman before. When the tax office said that they will tax you, they'll find ways to make it make life difficult for you. And I've experienced that. So let's start collaborating. Private, public, I, I have this great quote from David Rubenstein of Carlisle saying that in times of crisis, everybody gets together, bring the best of humanity to work together uh, in terms of how we could overcome this together. So the tax office, uh, in order to increase revenue post COVID, Definitely 2020 will be very difficult, but 2021, there's a, a sign of, uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel that we may be able to, uh, to, be, uh, to be having a much better economy. So let, this is a time for, for them to reform, work together, widen the tax base, get the IT company to identify people who have not been paying tax in the past, get them to, uh, go into the system because a lot of uh, people are more in the informal sectors, bring them to formal sectors. And then uh, with the lower uh, tariffs, with the lo lower tax rates, you'll be able actually with the expanded tax base, get a better revenue. So yeah, FinTech uh, is uh, a, a potential opportunity uh, to increase and they, they're, they're actually doing okay, doing well. Uh, pa Jeffrey. Secondly, SMEs. Liquidity is key, and I put it number one, cash is king. Uh, and I think uh, just like many other crises before, whereby SMEs always become the savior, they always uh, become the least acknowledged, but always every time 
they rise through the occasions and help Indonesia's economy. So naturally, you know, my passions and my heart will go to the SMEs uh, because time and time again, they never really asked for government bailouts. They never really, 2008, 2009, there were government bailouts. There's a Bank Santuri case. Uh, 97, 98, there are BLBI and corporate uh, sectors bailout, 600 trillions of uh, recovery, um, the re re bond that recap the banking system. Who benefit? It's mostly the, the big guys. So I'm part of that uh, establishment in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, part of the larger companies in Indonesia. But I think the one that we need to, uh, to focus more are the, the SMEs, the household. And yeah, um, we, we, we need to continue to push the government uh, and everybody actually, uh, because not only the government, we also have responsibility to help our uh, neighbors, our fellow brother and sisters of Indonesia to together we will we will be able to uh, overcome this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Thank you, Pak Jeffrey. Thank you, Bang. Um, so we actually have tons of questions here, uh, more than uh, 14. But so we won't, I don't think we'll be able to get through all of them. Uh, I apologize to the attendees if we don't get to all your questions. These are very good questions, actually, the Q&A and uh, the one in the chat. So I, I think, Pa Safendri, if you can. I will keep them down. You yeah, email we'll me, I'll, I'll provide quick answers for this. Oh, that'll be great, yeah. Uh, they, I think these are good questions and really need to be addressed. Uh, but we are right, uh, we are just right out of time. And uh, I hate to, to leave the, uh, uh, the webinar, uh, but if you are um, able to send those questions to me, I'll try my best to address those questions. Okay, Bang. So um, could you take one or two more questions uh, for this session? Sure, sure. sure. Okay. So uh, the next question is from Niken Sara from the question and answer section. I got um, it. Yeah, he asked, she asked about that this outbreak might continue until 2022 and it even can be, um, you know, resurgence can be as late as 2024. Uh, what are your comments on that? I mean, uh, in, in regards to the, the condition of SMEs in the context of SMEs. I have now become a COVID-19 so-called self-expert because <laughs> every night I go into conference call getting updates from doctors getting updates from policymakers, you know, around the world. Uh, and we, we go into teleconference video calls, uh, not only on economic investment, but also in, in health situation. And yes, true. The Harvard study say social distancing may go up to 2022. I don't know. I mean, Nikan, I think I, I would be very honest with you. It's too early to tell. We need to be guided by data. But these type of news, 2022, it's actually make us more depressing. It, it is uh, making us more depressed. So I try to not entertain those type of depressing news. I focus on some of the positive news, but I know because we have never experienced something like, the, like this. So I hope for the best, but I prepare for the worst. So for my friends at SME, I said that always um, expect for pray for the best, expect for the worst. And this is something that hopefully, because if collectively we could be more and more positive and optimistic, actually I heard one study also, I forgot now who did the study, uh, is actually your immunity is, is improving if you continue to, to think positively. So yeah, uh, the Harvard uh, studies I was forwarded by my by my daughter. My daughter is working now in, in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, she's working from home, but she, uh, she said that, that, you know, 2022, you know, I may be continuing working from home uh, until 2022. Uh, but yeah, I guess uh, we don't know. Um, it's only uh, God Almighty uh, who, would, who would know 
the, the real answers. Thank you, Bang. Yeah, the situation is really uncertain right now. Uh, and one of the best things that we can do is just stay positive. Um, Badian, go ahead, Badian. Um, Badian is one of our students, yes. Bang, from uh, the latest batch at SGPP. Yeah, I'm a student from Six Pep, Pak Sandi. I have a question about the, uh, what is SME for in a community of a fisher folk, fisher women and fishermen and a farmer, uh, agriculture and horticultural uh, product. Currently, they, they surplus, surplus in their product, but they face the problem on the, uh, selling the product because the market is uh, closed down. And we see that the government have no pay attention already for them to them. And uh, we just see uh, some of us GSO just help a small uh, community of the fisher folk or uh, farmer, uh, farmer, folk, farmer group to, uh, to reach uh, the digital, digital market, but that's very limited. Do you think this is possible? to uh, encourage government to pay attention to uh, the community as fisher folk community and the farmer and strengthen them in SME, but uh, in uh, how, I don't know how, uh, use the digital market, et cetera. But this is very important for us because we, we, ju we not just uh, strengthen the SMEs in uh, agriculture, we need to strengthen our food sovereignty after three months. Next three months after our food staff is zero. I think this is very important, and I already take uh, discuss with uh, what is PNPB, but they don't have any food strategy for the next. And I think uh, this is uh, hope uh, get some uh, advice from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Badian. That's a very good question because um, FAO, the uh, Food Administration's organizations uh, of the world, part of the, part of the United Nations just released a report that following the COVID-19, we will see food crisis. Now, Indonesia is really at a very, very unique positions. We have fertile land, we have seas, we have abundant natural resources, we have very uh, good farmers, fishermen, and they're working very hard. They have been really contributing to our food supply chain, but our trade and our policies catering towards these sectors have not been, I would say, effective at most. I was speaking with the Minister for Trade uh, a few days ago, uh, a good friend of mine now, Minister of Fishery and Ocean Maritime Affairs, Pa Edi, and I was speaking to Pa Prabhu only yesterday, and Pa Prabhu says, okay, Sandy, now that the government is asking for Perpu to push some money to the people and uh, you know, including Kartu Prakarja, we'll, we'll deal with Kartu Prakarja later, but it's basically putting money in the pocket of the people. But what if we don't have the goods, the food available for the people? What, what is the need for the money in the pocket if you cannot bring the food? So I completely agree with you, Ibu Dian, that we need to reform these sectors because our farmers uh, would need fertilizers. Our farmers would need certainty of uh, the bani, which is the seeds. They would also need the certainties of the price of their produce. And we need to ensure the distribution system that is open distribution system that is also uh, fair and transparent, simple and transparent. That way, all the produce that we have uh, received from farmers, from fishermen, would be able to feed Indonesians. Right now, the sugar, sugar is 19,000 per kilogram. 
uh, rice is creeping up also. The availability, it's, it's uh, a lot of people are, are getting really concerned. And this is where the government needs to step up. And my answers to you is yes, we can work together with the government if we have the willingness. Now from the private sectors, I think from my side, we have been able to put a constructive ideas uh, and it's up to the government whether they want to implement it or not. But you are spot on, Ibudian. I think this is something that, uh, you know, Pardantia is a big supporter of the current government. Uh, maybe he could help uh, convince <laughs> some of these uh, old-fashioned policies um, that, that have stayed there. I pushed to the Minister of Trade. I said that let's uh, forget about the quota system because the quota system breed uh, corruptions and breed, um, I guess, uh, entitlement uh, to people who are close to the government. Why don't we move to the tariff system? And, and fortunately, he listens, and I think we also agree. Uh, we, we're now slowly moving, at, at least until May, to the tariff system, and hopefully this will be able to supply the, the food uh, necessary for, uh, for the month of Ramadan. So thank you, Ibudian, for your questions. Thank you, Bang. So we have around 15 minutes left, uh, and Pardantia is here, um, and he raised his hand actually to ask you a question, maybe, Bang Sandi. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, Pardantia. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, and hello, my my respected uh, elder brother, Mas Sandi. I don't know. Uh, yes, I uh, I actually expect to to join the sessions is to to digging out uh, your perspective toward the SMEs. And I agree with you that the cash is number one. However, you're also talking about the digitizations uh, where that was one of the key to adapt to the, to the situation where I would uh, think that this COVID-19 is actually an acceleration of the, of the adoption to the digitals. But however, uh, now I'm talking on the perspective of educations and trainings. Uh, we know, everybody knows that actually the ability or the quality of the skills that uh, that is uh, possessed by the by the uh, lower class, middle class is still in that level. Where uh, now, actually, we would like to know uh, your perspective, Masandi. It's uh, how can we accelerate them? in order to be able to adopt to the technology, in order to make them more uh, competitive, in order to make them actually more productive, uh, which actually I am actually facing now, and I'm now staying in Malang, Masandi, and I am, I'm seeing a lot of SME and retail, small retails actually is dying to have transactions, and they're just not really easy to, to absorb inform, new information. So I would like to know your perspective on that, Mas. Thank you. Thank you, Mas Dantia. I think this is uh, something that we all need to focus. Uh, transformations into the digital economy, it's the new economy. Some of the SMEs uh, don't underestimate them. If you give them access to training, access to empowerment, uh, they would be able to adopt. A lot of people would remember three, four, five years ago when Pak Nadim Makarim introduced Gojek, a lot of people would probably raise their eyebrow, raise their eyebrow and saying that, how do we, um, how do we train all these um, object drivers to be able to adopt uh, digital applications and after two to three years we are showing again that SMEs are quick adapter to technology so uh, in order for us to accelerate the adoptions of technology and digitalizations Mas Dantia the government must take hand in hand a, a concept of public private partnership you cannot do it by yourself. In Jakarta, we started this movement uh, and now it has become, a, 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 the movement has transformed into a government program. 
whereby we uh, train close to 130,000 SMEs. And there are seven steps uh, of this OKOJ program. First is registra registrations. Secondly is uh, training. Uh, third is mentoring. Fourth is marketing. Uh, fifth is uh, legal and permit licensing. Six, and this is very important, is financial training, uh, cash flow training. And seventh is access to uh, capital. Once you go, once you let them through this training program, 60% of them adopt digitalizations. I was talking to Ibu Kamera, owner of Dapur Kamera. Before joining the program, she only used WhatsApp to chat, to uh, talk to uh, her daughters and to her friends. But now through the program, she has an online store. And through her Instagram, she would be able to sell her product, which is the uh, culinary products online. So this type of, uh, especially you are in Malang, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in the last uh, few years visiting Malang. Malang is going to also uh, face some difficulties because some uh, tourism as well as uh, travel is restricted. But Malang, again, is blessed by very fertile soil, good farmers. They have products such as um, tomat, tomato, uh, apple, you know, I see good uh, products from Malang, but during the harvest, the price drops. And during the, uh, when the price drops, not only they're able, not, not able to sell the products and get good prices, but also they're not able to even harvest the tomato because the price dropped. So again, you uh, need a public-private partnership. The government, local government, central government, and the private sectors there, because people still eat tomatoes. You know, uh, last week I spoke with some entrepreneurs from Hipmi uh, in Nganju. All their bawang merah, the red shallots, completely sold out. And they, the, every time they're uh, about to harvest, people are buying it. Because uh, right now, the COVID-19 caused people to, uh, you know, hopefully not panic buying, but they, they want to get access to supplies of, uh, of basic food, basic necessities like garlic, like, um, you know, their vegetables. So Malang is uh, key. And... I think if you are spending your time there, uh, you be great uh, help to the SMEs there because you have good access to people in uh, people making decisions upstairs, and also you have some entrepreneurial background from your HIPMI uh, connection. So thank you, Mas Dantia, for the for the support. Thank you, Mas Andy. Thank you, Bang. So we have around 10 more minutes. Um, would one more question be okay, Bang? Yes. Okay. So, um, well, there, sh there were students that raised their hands, but now their hands are down again. So I'm going to pick from the uh, Q&A uh, section. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase here, Bang. Uh, I think this is uh, the gist of many of the questions here um, about the... Yeah, about the government, but I mean, um, the package for stim stim stimulizing the SMEs, is that enough? And what needs to be done more in order to uh, help these, these SMEs to survive? Um, there's questions from Fauzan here also. What do I think about the government efforts so far? Well, it's not perfect, but the government have all limitations and I, I don't think it's fair to blame it all or to rely all on the government. Uh, we also have some responsibilities. We do have uh, our social responsibilities. And I think uh, the package or the policies to bring liquidity to the SMEs as well as to 
people at the bottom of the pyramid, the 40% uh, of the economic strata uh, would really help. Uh, but we are starting to hear stories. I don't know, uh, it seems to be a legitimate story, but it may be anecdotal uh, and let's not generalize things. But if we are all adopting our gotong royong and our social fabrics of helping each other, I don't think any of uh, our brothers and sisters in Indonesia needs to go uh, on uh, uh, go on hungry, uh, uh, and and they uh, there won't be any famine if we are responsible and making sure that we uh, we care, we share, uh, and this is the job not only uh, for the government but for for everybody, including including private sectors. Uh, community leaders and every one of us here. We are one of the more privileged. We still can sit down here, Zoom meeting, uh, and, and have not, no worries yet to, for the next meal. But uh, some people, uh, you know, our brothers and sisters have this type of concern. So it's, again, uh, going to, uh, be the burden of everybody. And today, uh, I went to uh, Wisma Atlet, Kemayoran. Uh, I pledge support on behalf of volunteers. Uh, and this is not uh, time to uh, to create more divisive uh, conversations or public discourse. I said, I'm here to help. We are putting a great effort to to distribute 10 million masks, uh, to distribute sembako to close to today 10,000 families. Uh, we also helping the government to do testing and tracing because we cannot fight this pandemic if we don't do testing. Uh, we just have to continue to be vigilant and push for more and more testing. And Jakarta, at the Greater Jakarta needs around 50,000 a day worth of this uh, rapid testing. And this will allow us to identify who's been infected and not. And this time, uh, this way, we will be able to track, to trace where uh, the possibility of more infections. So with, with this, I mean, COVID-19 is a test of our humanity and typically, a crisis like this will bring the best of humanity, the best of Indonesia, the best of our social fabric. We keep on saying Pancasila, Pancasila. We keep on saying Bineka Tunggal Ika Gotong Royong. This is the time that it is being called. So I, I think uh, um, I said enough. I hope uh, this lecture uh, will refocus our attentions to uh, to help the public policy maker, the policy makers to focus on the people, to focus on SMEs. Uh, and, and this way, together, again, I reiterate that I am 100% sure that we will be able to overcome COVID-19. Thank you very much. And wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very Waalaikumsalam. much for spending time with us. Uh, I hope you can join us again next time, maybe, hopefully. And we will also collect the questions um, that were not uh, answered today and we'll send it uh, to you immediately. Thank you very much, uh, Bang Sandi, for the time. And thank you very much, everyone, thank for you. attending uh, our you, public Pandi. lecture today. Thank you, uh, for Pandi. our students, for attendees. Um, thank, thank you very much for joining. And stay tuned for our next webina webinar.